Well, friends, in his book, Then Sings My Soul, Robert J. Morgan tells the story of a woman named Charlotte Elliott of Brighton, England. He says that uh, she was an embittered woman whose disability had hardened her, and perhaps many of us can relate to that. Our struggles, physical, mental, emotional, can really harden us to this life. She later told her story and told about the time when a minister named Dr. Caesar Milan came to speak with her. She says, he came in, and at first, I lost my temper, and I railed against him and my family and against God, and my family was mortified, and they left, but Dr. Milan stayed. He said, Charlotte, I, I love you, and I think you're holding on to your hate because you have nothing left to cling to, and consequently, you've become sour, bitter, resentful. What is your cure, Doc? And according to, to Charlotte, he said, the very faith that you claim to despise. She again later said that, that something in her began to soften in that moment. And she asked, okay, so if I wanted to become a Christian, if I wanted to, to, to possess this peace, this joy that you're proclaiming and that you seem to possess, what would I do? And Dr. Milan said, and I love this answer, you would give yourself just as you are right now, all of it, with all your fightings, all your fears, all your hates, and all your loves, and all your pride and shame, all of it. You would give yourself completely to God right now. All right, we'll come back to Charlotte in a little while. Let's go to Paul at this point, okay? Paul's words in his first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. Let's read these together. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. It's the word of God for the people of God, and together we say, thanks, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Friends, I don't know if y'all knew this or not, but um, we are a mess. <laughs> Thank you. Can I get any other amen? Anybody else feel like a mess? We are a mess. I think we tend to go one of two ways uh, in this world. We, we tend to think either, you know, we are perfect and everybody else is a disaster, or uh, we are a disaster and everybody else is perfect. Both of those are false, okay? Both of those are false. We are, every one of us, a mess all the time. A mess. We smell. We have our warts, figurative and literal, okay? Yes, it's true, we do. We fight, we complain, we bicker, we forget things. I told y'all the story a couple weeks ago about putting the, the coffee mug twice in a row uh, or forgetting to put the coffee mug twice in a row under the Keurig so that when I pressed the button, it just ran out all over the floor and then I did the same thing again. Okay, I got to men's group on Wednesday this week, and one of the fellows took me aside and said, hey, that story you told about that, that's nothing. Guess what I did this week? <laughs> he said, I put the coffee mug under the Keurig, upside down. <laughs> he said, it made the perfect shield <laughs> to deflect the coffee all over my kitchen. <laughs> we are a mess. We never fail to be a mess. Morally, we're a mess. We are selfish. 
Me, 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 me. Want, 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 want. Right? I want, I want to be respected. I want to be admired. I want to be successful. I want to be comfortable. Uh, we obsess over our image. Y- you know what, what my obsession was as a teenager choir and a probably young adult too? My image. <laughs> my hair. I had forgotten about that one actually. That's true. How do you? That's true. I did obsess over my hair which seems pretty ironic now, doesn't it? My other obsession uh, in terms of my image was I really wanted to be huge. <laughs> but at least, at least that one worked out for me, <laughs> right? We're a mess. We're a mess, church, and we cannot hide it. We cannot hide it. I still think church is the best thing we have going for us, in this world, I really do, and, and I think we have too often substituted pious appearances for faith. Say that again, we have too often substituted pious appearances for faith, right? How many times in history, how many times have people, have Christians, have, have families come to church and, and sort of put on the appearance of having it all together, right? Everything is, is fine, uh, the appearance of normalcy, the appearance of uprightness, when in fact, they were completely broken inside. Their lives, their families, completely broken. And if we cannot be honest if we can't be honest with each other and with God about our brokenness, if we can't be honest about our sinfulness, how can we ever expect to heal and to grow through and beyond that brokenness? We cannot hide it, and we shouldn't. And, and we can't climb out of it either. We may think we can, but we cannot climb out of it. Let's be honest. There is, there is maybe just a little bit of tension between that old frontier value of self-reliance and that biblical value of relying only and completely upon God. Those things are, those things are maybe a little bit in, ten, in tension. Pull, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Kneel at the cross. Or how about this one? Take control of your life. Is that the biblical message? Or is the biblical message, let go of control of your life and hand it over into the hands of God in Christ? These things are a little bit in tension. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in hard work, okay? I believe in hard work. I do. But there's a fine line between that and works righteousness. I think I said a couple of weeks ago, again, that, that first step in the 12-step process, which is not specifically biblical, but that I think hits, hits right, on, right, right at the heart, right on target with the biblical message. Admit you are powerless. Admit you are powerless. All power, all authority belongs to whom? To God. Y'all, that's hard for people like me who want to be in control. We like to be in control, but there is no strategic plan. There is no organizing principle. There is no Tower of Babel that we can build and climb up into the hands of God. And then there's this other thing. There's this other thing that happens. And it's Ooh, it's just close enough to truth that it can kind of masquerade as truth, all right? But it's rotten at its core. We say this. We say, if I lean in close to God, then God will strengthen me. And that's true. That's true. But when we say that, when we say that, how often do we want to define that strength 
in worldly, individualistic terms. Okay? I lean in close to God. God will strengthen me. And by that, maybe we understand that to mean uh, God will make me more capable. God will make me more confident. God will make me more successful. God's strength makes Justin more. And it will get me more respect, more admiration, more success, more comfort. But that's not what Paul says, church. That's not what Paul says. Go back to the text. 1 Corinthians there. What What does Paul say? It was not I, but the grace of God that's with me. Not not God takes me and makes me more. More power, more success, more admiration. Right? It's, It's the hope that little by little, little by little in Christ, Justin's character diminishes and gives way to the character of God gives way to the character of God so that Justin ceases to care about admiration and power and success and all those worldly things that we crave. Friday night, we had a, we had a little family event here at the church. We had a passel of kids running around, and... Uh, they were all with the adults in the gathering area, and then they weren't one of those situations. And I thought, oh, where'd they go? So I got up and, and uh, headed over to the kids' wing, and they were, uh, a group of them was, was gathering in the, the room that is currently serving as the nursery and primary room, which is a great place for them to be, actually. Toys and all kinds of wonderful things they can play with in there. But I thought, you know what, I'll just stay over here. Um, I, I don't need to go in. Um, I just want to make sure nobody dies, you know, that there's no screaming or anything. So there was a chair sitting out in the hallway, and I just sat down in that chair. And I'm just sitting and listening and kind of occasionally looking in, checking on the kids. And as I sat there, my eyes drifted up to one of the banners that's hanging over there in that hallway. We have banners with these uh, sort of cartoon versions of Bible characters and, and Bible passages written on them. And I was thinking a little bit about this message, this text for today, and and the message I was going to be proclaiming. And I looked up at this passage on the wall, and I want to share it with you now. We're going to actually look at two passages of Scripture today. (gasps) We can do that. It's okay. More Bible. It's good. Uh, This one is from 2 Corinthians. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. I looked up, and I read this. My grace, this is God speak, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. And I thought, wow, that's it. That's it. That's the message, right? That's the message that we're proclaiming today. Not that God will make us Hollywood perfect paragons of virtue and success so that other people look at us and say, wow, I want to be like him or I want to be like her. Paul says that what God really wants, what God really wants is weak, messy, broken, imperfect, normal people who somehow, somehow in the midst of all that, are filled with a love and a peace and a hope and a joy that surpasses all understanding. And those are the people who can make an impact, by the way. You know, people may look at the Hollywood star and say, oh yeah, I wish I had all that. But those are the people who can make an impact because, because people, people look at you when you are that and say, wow, you know, she's, she's a mess just like I am. And somehow there is this, this peace and this hope about her. How is that possible? And how can I get some of that? Right? So from that, that imperfect mess, from that, from that place 
of messiness where we all live, imperfect, but held in the Spirit of Christ. Imperfect, but held in the Spirit of Christ. From that place, we step out and do the best that we can with what we've got in this world. We put ourselves out there seeking to ignore the risks, the opinions of others, the fear of failure. We go out just as we are, but held in the spirit of the living Christ, and we do the best we can. It's true for us as individuals. It's true for us as church, okay? I saw a beautiful post on Facebook this week that said, quit looking for the perfect church and go worship a perfect God with a bunch of messy, regular people. (laughs) Amen? Amen. Amen. We put ourselves out there in all our imperfection just as we are. My parents tell a story about me that I'm, I'm too young. I, I was too young to, to now remember. Um, when, I was, when I was a child, I was sickly. I had health issues as a child. Um, I'm sure that's the only reason I'm not now 6'1", 210. <laughs> um, uh, my, might have had a role. Anyway, I was sick, and I couldn't go out. I couldn't really leave the house much for a long time, my first couple of years. Uh, and so I, I was, you know, I was in the house, but we had this window that looked out on the backyard, and from that window I could see the neighbor's little dog in, in their backyard, and it was my favorite thing. It was my source of joy to watch this little dog run around and, and bark and, and, and do what, whatever little dogs do, okay? And so one of my very first words was, bow wow, <laughs> bow wow. And I would, I would call to my dad when the dog came out, bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. So then, a year or two later, I finally got to the point where my health was such that my parents felt comfortable taking me out of the house. And my dad decided, he'd been waiting, he'd been excited to do this. He took me to the park for the first time to play. And we got to the park, and it was packed with kids running around and the swings and the slides and all that stuff. And he said, I walked out, and my eyes were like saucers, taking in the chaos, the the beauty, the noise of the world out there that I hadn't experienced. And then he said, I did something very curious. I stepped out, and I said, bow wow, (laughs) bow wow. And at first he thought, what is he doing? What are you doing? But he said the more he thought about it, the more he realized, that was my best word. That was the best word I had. And so as I stepped out into the world, I wanted to give it my best. And so I yelled out, bow wow, bow wow. He later called it my first sermon. And there may be some in the room who think I peaked at, at that point <laughs> in my story. My dad, of course, you all, many of you know this. Uh, my dad, late in life, developed Alzheimer's. And, and I think as I think about this, you know, stepping out just as you are, I, I think about him and I think about people with some of these challenges too, Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, my, my dad lost all his words, Okay. I think I've told you before, though, that he would, there at the, at the memory care center, he would walk around and he would go up to people sitting in their wheelchairs and he would take their hands and look them in the eye and just smile. And that is how, I believe, he proclaimed the gospel. That's how he preached the word, even though all his words were gone. People with Alzheimer's and dementia are every bit as precious to God as every other person upon this earth. And... They have a purpose, because as long as you have breath in this life, you have purpose. I believe my dad was living his purpose in that way. And maybe you've experienced people with some of those challenges living their purpose in beautiful and surprising ways, just as they, just as they were, just as they are. Maybe they don't have the ability to do what they once could, but they are yet a servant of God, just as they are. I think about 
this man that worked in the soup kitchen at the, at the church that I served in, in Los Angeles, California, uh, he was homeless. And he, in, in the years I was there, he never missed, he never missed showing up at the, the soup kitchen days. We did them twice a week at that church. He never once missed showing up at those, not to eat, but to serve. He worked, and he worked, and he worked. And during my time there, he never did quite figure out how not to be homeless, but you better believe he, he lived with purpose. You better believe that he stepped out just as he was and did what he could to serve his siblings in Christ in this world just as he was. I think of, uh, I think of many people in this church. Uh, you know what, Dave? I think of you, brother. I think of you because, and you, Sherry, because this has been a hard season for y'all. But here you are, just as you are, and you are beloved. We love you. God loves you more than words can say. And we're so grateful that despite the challenges that you've been facing, that every Sunday morning you, you get up and, and Sherry helps you Get dressed and get in your chair and get over here just as you are. Can I get an amen for Dave and his journey? I think of many of our senior adults in this congregation, especially those who have, who have lost their beloveds. Whew, yeah, Jerry. Jerry took a deep breath when I said that. Uh, I don't think there's any words that I could say that would do justice to how hard that is. Joan? But here you are just as you are, stepping out each Sunday morning, putting yourselves in Christian community, doing the best that you can to glorify your God, just as you are. And I think of Charlotte Elliott, that woman I talked about at the beginning of this message. She later said that she did give herself to God just as she was. And she was amazed to find a peace and a joy that she never thought possible despite the fact that her health issues never did go away. One day, she said, I was moved to write a poem about my experience. Dr. Milan, who had come and proclaimed faith to me, her journey that she embarked upon that day. She did write that poem. She later turned it into a hymn. It was the first of over 150 hymns that she wrote, and it is still, quite possibly, the most famous invitational hymn that ever was. After her death, her family found among her papers over a thousand letters from people that wrote to her, expressing gratitude for the ways that that hymn had, had touched their lives. It went like this. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come.